Please turn in your Bibles this morning to 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 9. This is on page 1015, if you're using the Pew Bible. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 9. Here the Apostle Peter writes as the Holy Spirit leads and directs him. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming together as a body to worship you this morning. We thank you that uh, in your word you reveal very clearly what you would have the church to be about, what, what the church is, what it is to be and to do. And we ask this morning as we review these things here at the start of the new year that you help us to very clearly see what your word says and understand it, but not only see it and understand it, but be excited and encouraged and desiring to live these things out to the fullest, to be a church that practices these things. I thank you for this body of believers who uh, is, is so desiring to live for you and serve you, and we're, we're doing these things uh, already. But Father, we ask that uh, even more and more here in 2023, you would take us and use us by your Holy Spirit to honor and glorify your great name. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. One thing that I often enjoy on uh, my vacation Sundays is going out and visiting uh, different churches. Sometimes my family isn't always the most excited by that because, well, sometimes I choose some churches they don't think are the best churches to go to. You can ask them about that question. But I like doing that because it gives me another perspective on how a church conducts its worship service, uh, what they're like in the ministry of the Word, some of the different programs, some of the different ministries that they have. Uh, but also, it, it, it's helpful for me because it, it gets me to think, I, I need to be clear on what the Bible says, here's what the church is to be about. Here's what the church is to do. Because you go to different churches, and you know there's all kinds of different ways of doing things, but it's so important to analyze, are we doing things as a local church that God is calling us as a church to do? He doesn't call us to do everything. There's only some things in particular that he calls the church to do. And when I visit other churches, it always makes me think about that. So you get the overflow of that this morning. Uh, what would you say about that? What is the church to be and, to, and do? What, what is the church about? Who are we as a local church? For instance, you know what a plumbing company is about. Uh, they take care of your pipes and, and your plumbing needs and uh, if, if you had a need for uh, a loan or seeking investment advice, you wouldn't go to a plumbing company to ask for that. Uh, you know what a bank is about, so you wouldn't go to a bank for a plumbing issue or if you have pipes that burst or something like that. You don't go to a bank for that because you know what a bank does. But what's the church about? How would you describe that? I think you'd all describe a bank or a plumbing company or all kinds of other businesses that are out there or even institutions. But what about a church? What is it about? What is the church to be and do? And maybe you're thinking, why do I even care about an answer to that question? Well, just like you wouldn't call a bank to come and fix your plumbing problems or you wouldn't call a plumbing company to seek financial advice or a loan or something like that, so also, uh, you, you need to know as, uh, what a church is about. You wouldn't be looking for the church to do something that it is not called to do. For instance, you wouldn't be looking at a church to give you a rock concert experience. That's not really what the church is called to be and do. There's all kinds of great music styles, and churches can use all kinds of different styles, but if your main reason for choosing a church is, I want a rock concert experience, you're kind of missing the boat. That, that's not what the church is to be and do. So what are we to be and do? What, what are we called to do? 
Uh, one other thing before I, you probably just want me to answer that question. I, one other thing, why it's important to know that, is sometimes churches, if you're not clear on what you're called to do in the scripture, uh, you can begin focusing on something that's important and good and even biblical, but if you don't know all what God calls the church to do, you can focus on that one thing to such an extent that you begin to neglect other things that God calls the church to be and do. For instance, uh, there's you've probably heard of the church growth movement. Maybe you haven't, but uh, sometimes in the church growth movement, and, and it, it has a great desire for evangelism and winning the lost, and that's terrific, and we're going to see that's part of what the church is called to be and do. But sometimes there's such an emphasis on that and getting people through the front doors or the back door of the church that there's almost a fear. I don't know if I want to say this about God. It's true, but I don't know if I want to say this about God because it might drive some unbelievers away. They might not like it if I'm saying this about God. So I'm not going to do that. Well, that's, that's not... That's not good. Uh, we, we shouldn't just be asking, does this please people or even does it please unbelievers? Rather, we should be asking, does it please God? And when we know the answer to the question, what does God call the church to be and to do? That helps us to answer, uh, does this please God or not? If he's telling us, this is what you're about, and you're not doing that, well, that's not pleasing to the Lord. So, there's different ways that you can name the things that I'm going to name. There, You could probably put it in four statements or two statements or however many statements. Uh, but somehow, some way, every church that's striving to be biblical should, should be striving for at least these three things. First, exalt him who called us. Second, evangelize the lost. And third, edify the body of Christ. Uh, the Bible is a big book. There's lots of things that we see God call us to do as individuals throughout the Bible. So why do we choose these three uh, areas, these three descriptions to bring out, this is what God has called the church to do? Answer, because in these passages that we'll be looking at this morning, they're all passages that focus not simply on us as individuals, but us as, as a church, as a body of believers. That's why we look to these three areas in particular, that this is what we're about as a church. This is what we're called to do as a church. This is our focus today. If you're not there already, uh, please turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And we see here the first and primary thing that God calls us to as a church in Peter's words here. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, page 1015 in the Pew Bibles. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Uh, Verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Uh, first, I just want you to notice all these descriptions that are given here in 1 Peter chapter 2. A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. God's people. In other words, uh, these are descriptions in this passage of us as a group. It's not just looking to you as an individual believer before God. In this passage, Peter's talking about us as a group of people. This is what you are. This is what you are as the church. It's not just individual thing here. This is a churchy setting, in other words. Second, look at verse 9 again. We see God's purpose for calling us together as a people. Verse 9 but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That, here, here's the purpose. We are God's people. He's done these amazing things to save us and call us together as this, this holy nation. He's done this 
for this reason, for this purpose, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's from this passage that we derive our first description of what we're about as a church. What's, what's the church called to do? And that is to exalt him who called us. To exalt him who called us. In verse 9, we see the word proclaim. Uh, one Bible scholar just gives a one word synonym for proclaim, and he, he uses the word advertise. Uh, sometimes we get a negative opinion about that, so maybe don't think too hard on that. But with a little fuller description, definition, a Greek lexicon says this of, of this word proclaim. To make known by praising or proclaiming. To celebrate. This is proclaim. Proclaim his excellencies. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, he, as he gives this purpose statement for why God has gathered us together as a people and a holy nation and all these kind of things, probably Peter is deriving this from uh, an Old Testament passage, maybe even a couple different Old Testament passages, uh, referring to his people Israel in the Old Testament. But in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 21... Almost certainly this, this purpose statement is derived from that. Isaiah 43, verse 21, it says, The people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. You know, we get all kinds of benefits from being God's people. We're forgiven our sins. We have eternal life. We know the living God. We're encouraged. We can have the fruit of the Spirit, joy, relationships, all these kind of things. It's great. But on, on a, I guess we'd say from God's side, there, there's a purpose that he called us together as well. Not just for our own blessing, but that we might declare his praise. In 1 Peter 2 verse 9, Peter, uh, let me put it this way. In Isaiah 43 verse 21, that's up on the screen. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, uh, there's a term for declare that you see on the screen. That's, that's one word. When Peter derives what he says in 1 Peter chapter 2, 9, from this passage, he changes to a different Greek term uh, for proclaim instead of declare, proclaim. One Bible scholar notes this, and this is why I'm bringing this out here. He says, Peter has chosen an equivalent term, but one more specifically focused on worship between declare and proclaim. They're very similar. But in 1 Peter 2 verse 9, the term Peter uses here is really, it's focusing in on this area of worship. Now, what does Peter say? We're to be declaring, proclaiming, celebrating, exalting in the excellencies of him who called us. God's excellencies, they're not only his attributes, his characteristics that are revealed in the scripture, but also, and maybe even more emphasis on this, his actions, his deeds that we find in the scripture that show forth his attributes and his characteristics. That's why the first description of what we're about as the church what we're to do as a church is to exalt him who called us. We want to proclaim his greatness. We want to praise him for what he's done. Having this as an understanding of what we're about as God's people helps us to remain God's, God-centered as a local church. Not resort to simply doing whatever would get people through the door, but above all else, we are proclaiming him, exalting him. As a body, above all, we do this as we gather for corporate worship on Sundays. For some of you, you might be thinking, of course, that's what a church is about. You gather together, you assemble, that's what church even means. But for others, maybe you haven't really heard what I'm going to say uh, before about our corporate worship. Again, that's when we gather together like this on a Sunday morning. 
That is a huge part of how we exalt the God who has called us. Corporate worship isn't something that we just do maybe once or twice a year when we feel like it or on the big, big, big seasons of Easter and Christmas. Uh, This is a top priority for us, worship. Turn over to John chapter 4 in your Bibles. John chapter 4. This is on page 889 in the Pew Bibles. John chapter 4. Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman here. And he says, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. First note here, it's almost an amazing little statement that Jesus makes, but he says, the Father is seeking such people to worship him. I don't know what priority level you put on uh, uh, corporate worship, but here Jesus says, the Father is seeking true worshipers. In other words, it's a big deal to him. Second, he says, those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth. Uh, When we went through this passage, I don't know, maybe two or three years ago, four years ago, whenever it was, I I went into great detail on this. But in essence, worshiping in spirit on truth, when we say worshiping in spirits, uh, the idea is uh, you have experienced the Holy Spirit coming inside of you and transforming your human spirit. You, you have, you've got to experience, you've got to have been born again, and the Spirit has come in to transform you. That, that's part of the worship that the Father is seeking here. And what about worshiping in truth? Well, Jesus is the truth, and true worshipers must come to the Father only through Jesus Christ. Uh, so again, uh, true worshipers are those uh, certain people who've been born again. They, they have the Holy Spirit now inside of them, and they've come to the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ, the truth. This is the kind of people that God calls to worship him, to exalt him. This is us as born-again believers in Jesus Christ. But how do we proclaim This is the kind of people, but how do we proclaim his excellencies? We do this as we proclaim what he's revealed of himself in his word. With the scripture readings, with the preaching based on the word of God. And not shying away from what God has revealed about himself. Not thinking, "Ah, I don't know if this is practical or not, that that the word of God says this about God, so I'm going to neglect it. No, if God says it and if it's about him... We're proclaiming his excellencies. That's what we're about. We're, we're going to do this. We do this with teaching and the various ministries that we have. Sunday school and Bible studies and kids clubs and fellowship groups. First and foremost, as a local church, we are about proclaiming him. Uh, in the Psalms, and maybe you didn't realize this, And if you didn't, you should come to Sunday evening services because we're going through all the Psalms right now. And you'll hear this on Sunday evenings. But maybe you didn't realize this, that in the Psalms, those were actually initially uh, songs to be sung of praise to God. In the Psalms, we see how in the Old Testament, for the Old Testament people, Israel, in their worship as they're singing the songs, they were proclaiming God's greatness, his excellencies. So we today, not only through the preaching and teaching and studying of the word of God, but also in our music, our, our, our singing, yes, it encourages each other and we motivate, motivate each other and uh, talk about, yeah, let's, let's praise God and things like that. That's part of it. But we also want to proclaim in our singing God's excellencies, his greatness, his great acts that he has done throughout history. We do that in song, in singing. Uh, one of my favorite hymns is To God Be the Glory, and that was an early favorite hymn of uh, Heart, 
Holmes Park Bible Church, uh, I, I think this hymn does what proclaiming his excellencies is all about. It does it so well in the opening line of that hymn. It just says, you probably all know this, but to God be the glory, great things he has done, so loved he the world that he gave us his son. There's that proclamation. There's that exalting in God. His excellencies. Uh, remember, his excellencies are the things that he has done, and that's what we sing about in that hymn. Great things he had done. And then we even talk about those things he has done. Uh, he's gave us his son. That, that's, that's proclaiming his excellencies. And we bring out his attributes. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. So, I don't know if you just like it as a hymn or as a catchy tune or whatever, but, but that's what we're about. That's, that's a great example in one line of proclaiming his excellencies. So what we're about as a church and what we're called to do is proclaim his excellencies, exalt him, worship him. And as that hymn that I just mentioned, To God Be the Glory, brings out, the greatest of all God's actions is the cross work, the saving work, of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's the great action because it brings and highlights all God's attributes. I shouldn't say all, but many of God's attributes uh, in the fullest sense, his attribute of love and mercy and grace and holiness and righteousness and justice and wrath. We see all those things brought together in this action of God sending his son to die for our sins on the cross. So in the gospel, the gospel that Christ died for our sins and rose again from the dead, when we're proclaiming the gospel, we are proclaiming God's excellencies. That leads into the next thing God has called us to do as a church. Evangelize the lost. Exalting God, proclaiming his excellencies, that's our ultimate priority. But a great way that we proclaim his excellencies is by proclaiming the gospel as we seek to evangelize the lost. So turn over in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, this is on page 835 in the Pew Bibles. Of course, this is after Jesus was crucified, after he was resurrected from the dead. It's before Jesus ascended into heaven. Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. When I say evangelize the lost, evangelize is derived from the Greek word for gospel and sharing the gospel. But the command here by Jesus, not just to these individuals, but these individuals as they represent the church, uh, and I take it that's the case. Note how he speaks here of, I'll be with you even to the end of the age. This goes beyond just you as the people here right now, but you as you represent the church, Jesus says, I'm going to be with you to the end. The command here by Jesus to these individuals as they represent the church is, make disciples. So why do I say evangelize? Uh, the same word, make disciples, in the original languages, it's used in Acts chapter 14, verse 21. And it says there, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, same Greek root word there as Matthew 28, <clears throat> they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Okay, how did they make disciples? According to Acts 14, verse 21, they preached the gospel. Whoever said that, good job. Euangelisamenoi. Uh, that maybe doesn't quite sound like it, but does it sound a little bit like evangelize? 
That, that's where the word evangelism comes from. Evangelize comes from of preaching the gospel. When someone positively responded to the gospel as it was preached, as it was proclaimed, as, as they're being evangelized, when someone responded to that, they were made a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's why we say the second thing that we are called to do as a church is to evangelize the lost. We share the good news of Jesus with people with the goal of seeing them become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Sometimes there's some confusion on what, what a disciple is. So what's a disciple? One standard reference work puts it this way uh, about disciple. The usage is from the very first characterized by the fact that, apart from a few exceptions, disciple denotes the men who have attached themselves to Jesus as their master. Always implies the existence of a personal attachment which shapes the whole life of the one described as disciple. So a disciple is someone who acknowledges Jesus as their master. This personal attachment to Jesus Christ that shapes someone's whole life. This is what we're about as a local church. So you as individuals, me as an individual, be thinking of friends and neighbors or family members you could be sharing the gospel with. Be praying for open doors in your daily lives to have an opportunity to evangelize, to share the gospel with someone with the goal of seeing them become a disciple of Jesus Christ. As a church, we're very privileged to have Steve Hughes as our church evangelist. He shares the gospel. Day by day, he's out sharing the gospel, sowing gospel seed. He's seen many people respond to the gospel. But as a church, one easy way, apart from what I just said, pray for open doors for yourself, opportunities for yourself, friends, families, na na neighbors. One easy way you could be involved as a church in evangelism is to go out with Steve Hughes on gospel calls. I know from talking with Steve, it would thrill his heart. It does thrill his heart whenever someone goes out with him. It would thrill mine also. I'd be so excited here in this new year of 2023 to hear people say, yes, I'd love to go out with Steve and evangelize with him. Uh, coming up this spring, we don't have a date set for this yet, but Steve will be leading Saturday mornings, I think will almost certainly be the case. On Saturday mornings, Steve will be leading an evangelism training class to help equip you as a believer so that whether you're Steve or by yourself or talking to a neighbor or whoever, you can say, yeah, I know how to evangelize. I know how to share the gospel. I can do that. And then after that course ends, I'll be leading a class right after that on using the follow-up materials we've developed as a local church for those who've become new disciples. So be on alert for these equipping ministries that are coming up this spring. Uh, and another thing, uh, while I'm talking about this, even now with our evangelism ministries as a church, we're trying something a little bit different on follow-up of new professing believers. It'd be great to have some of you helping out with that ministry also. Uh, I'm not going to get into great detail because time is, is moving quickly along here, but if you'd at all be interested in helping out with uh, our evangelistic ministries, whether going out with Steve or maybe helping with follow-up of, of those who've made professions of faith in Christ, uh, talk to me later. Give me a call. Email me. We'd, we'd love to see more people involved in this aspect of what we're about as a local church. One other thing I'd like you to note. I'm, I'm being like Columbo this morning. Just one more thing. Just one more thing. We're still here in Matthew 28. Look down to verse 19 again. Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. This is why we support missionaries here. Thank you, Mike Voss, for giving the presentation earlier this morning. Financially, we support several missionaries. Prayerfully, we support several missionaries. We were, as Mike brought out, we're, we're sending uh, Steve Hughes to Israel. So, so we do that. And there are others from Heartland who will be sending out. We, we do this to the nations. 
Uh, when, when we do this, we're just seeking to be faithful to our Lord's commission to us as a church when he says, make disciples of all nations. I'm not great at repeating quotes, especially if I don't have it written before me and I don't have this exactly right. But once when I was at a pastor's conference, a quote something like this, but better was given. Uh, the church that doesn't engage in missions will soon become a mission field. I'm thankful that as a church, we are very missions-minded. But again, this, this is part of our commission as a local church. Now, according to Matthew 28 and verse 19, what happens after someone becomes a disciple? Look at verse 19 again. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, so after someone becomes a disciple, after they're saved, after they receive Christ, they're to be baptized. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Teaching. This is, this is what a, a new disciple is to be taught to observe all that Jesus has commanded. That element of Jesus' commission to the church is highlighted in this final thing that I, I take it we're called to do as a church. Uh, how so? We're, we're going to see in a moment that the work doesn't end once someone becomes a disciple. They're to be baptized after that. They're to be taught and the teaching is ongoing. That's really the rest of our lives as disciples were to be taught the Apostle Paul develops how we as a church are to be engaged in this area. This is the third broad area of what we're about as a local church, what Jesus has called us to do as a church, and that is edify the body of Christ. Turn over in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Ephesians 4, verse 11. This is on page 977 in the Pew Bibles. Ephesians 4, verse 11, Paul writes, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. Building up. That's what I mean by edifying. Actually, the King James Version translates it as edifying. Uh, verse 12 it says uh, in the King James Version, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Uh, so when I say edifying, I just mean what ESV translates it as building up. And you say, well, why, why use edify then if, if you just mean building up? Well, this is kind of silly, but hopefully when I say the church is about three things and they all start with the letter E, it, it's a little more memorable. And you know what? I, at the end of the message today, I'm going to ask for a, a shout-out quiz of what the three purposes or the three things the church is called to do. I'm going to ask you to shout it out. So be thinking about that. But it, it's just, I think, more memorable. If you have three E's, uh, exalt, evangelize, edify, that's a little more uh, memorable. So that's why I'm using the word edify there. But edify, it just means build up. And here it's building up the body of Christ. Uh, this is an architectural kind of term. Sometimes we think of building up as, well, I want to build you up. I want to encourage you. That's not quite the idea here of this term edify or build up. Uh, earlier in Ephesians, turn over probably a page in your Bible, maybe not even a page, maybe on the same page, to Ephesians 2 verse 20. Ephesians 2 verse 20. Let's, let's start with verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Verse 20, built. Okay, this is just a verb form with a prefix at the start of it of the noun build up that we saw in Ephesians 4 verse 12. So it's that kind of same architectural term as a prefix in front of it, but it's the verb form of that. 
built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. When we're talking about building, why, why this is significant is that this building that now as a church we're called to build up is, is now in this new covenant age, it is the holy temple in the Lord. That's what we're trying to build up when we talk about this third element of us as a local church. Verse 22. In him you are also being built together. Again, that's a, a verb. Uh, Ephesians 4 verse 12 is a noun. It has a different prefix in front of it here than uh, the word in verse 20 had, but same kind of root word there. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So, so the church is a holy temple in the Lord. And this is this building now as a local church, we're trying to build this up. We're trying to see this building constructed here. And just as for this church building that we're sitting in, it had plans, and you had to have plans to see, well, what do you want it to look like? And what do you want to, uh, the measurements and all these kind of things. So also, we see in Ephesians 4 that God gives us the plan for what he wants this holy temple in the Lord, in a spiritual sense, to look like. Uh, verse 13, turn back to Ephesians 4. So edify, build up. This is the third thing we're about as a church. That's Ephesians 4, verse 12. Verse 13 says, here's what it's supposed to look like. Here's this spiritual building that we're talking about. I want you to build it up. This is our, our calling as a church, as believers, What's that supposed to look like? Ephesians 4, verse 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Three basic areas, our, our design, our plans that are laid out before us by God here are unity, maturity, and Christ-likeness. This is what we're building this holy temple up to look like. Uh, we're seeking to grow more and more into a unity of the faith and of a knowledge of the Son of God. We want a unity in doctrinal areas. This isn't a small thing. Doctrine isn't a little thing. This is what we're building the church up to. This is what we're about when we're talking about building up the church. We want unity, maturity, mature manhood. Uh, really, this is the opposite of uh, what's said in Ephesians 4, verse 14. Look there in your Bibles, where Paul says, so we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. As a church, we want to be those who are mature so we're not like verse 14, children just tossed here and there, every new teaching that comes along, every new practice that comes along. Some, some might be good, so we might want to do that, but some is just crazy stuff, but it's very popular. So you can just picture these churches and they're on the latest wave and they go up and they go down and you know all, all this kind of stuff. It, we want as a church to be mature, where we're not caught up in the latest fads, if it's, again, if it's something good, yes, let's do it. But not just because it's the new hot thing. We don't want to do it because of that. Finally, Christ-likeness. Verse 13, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. As a church body, we want to be more and more like Jesus Christ in this world. When we talk about growing, this is what we should all be striving for individually. And as, as individuals, if we're growing to be more like Jesus Christ, then as a local church, we will be more and more like Jesus Christ. We're his body in this world. Uh, Jesus once said, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. That's the idea. We're, we're made disciples 
And just as, as believers, we want to be growing to be more and more like our teacher, Jesus Christ. I, I hope you'd say something like this. I, I want to be more like Jesus Christ this year than I was last year. I want to be more like Jesus Christ this year than I was five years ago, or for some of you 20 years ago, or 30 years ago. That's what I want to strive for. I want to be like my master. I want to, I, I'm a disciple, and I want to be like my teacher, Jesus. Is that what you want? That's what, as, as church leadership, that's what we want for you. That's what we want this local church to be like. Christ-like more and more. We won't ever get there until we hit heaven. But more and more as we live in this world, we want to be more and more like Jesus Christ. This is behind our teaching and our praying and our, our preaching, all the different ministries that we have as a local church that are focused on this edifying ministry. We, what's behind that, the goal behind that is edification and edification to unity, maturity, Christ-likeness. We've been in Ephesians, we're taking a little break from Ephesians right now, but we've been in Ephesians for a while. I love Ephesians. One thing I love about Ephesians chapter 4 is not only does it tell us what we're to be about as a local church, edify the body, not only does it tell us what we're to build up the body towards unity, maturity, Christ-likeness, but it even gives us the means of getting there. A few months back, we spent a whole message on this, and I'm going to do it in two minutes. But uh, this morning, just very briefly, the means of how we get there, how, uh, how are we as a church to grow towards unity, maturity, and Christ-likeness? First, the body grows by speaking the truth in love. Truth, capital T, Bible truth. We speak to each other Bible truth, and we do it in love. Not, not to put people down, not to hurt them, not to destroy them. Speak the truth in love. Second, the body grows in dependence on the head, Jesus Christ. Prayer is one of the great ways that we express dependence on him. Third, the body grows in connection with one another. Yes, during our church services, very important. That's a way that we, that's really the only way that as a whole body, we can connect with one another. The whole, no house could fit us all. But yes, that's important. But just having times to be around other believers during the week is important as well. Maybe it's in ministry with someone, or maybe it's in a Bible study, or in a life group, or a fellowship time. But those are all means, uh, connecting with one another, that's a means that God uses, it's a means he's given us to build up the body towards unity, maturity, Christ-likeness. Next, the body grows in proportion to the working of each individual part. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a spiritual gift. We need you to, to grow like we're called to grow and to grow towards unity and maturity and christ likeness. We need you to be using your spiritual gift somewhere here in the life of this local church. During announcements, I mentioned on January 22nd, we're having this uh, ministry informational meeting. Part of that will be, we're just going to have a listing of about every ministry that we can possibly think of. And, and if you're there, uh, we'll, we'll pass out a sheet or a booklet or something like that. And you can look at those things and say, you know what, I'd kind of be interested in helping in this area. Maybe I don't know at this moment in time if I'm gifted in there or not, but it interests me at least. I, I'd like to serve somehow, some way. So, uh, you can find a place to serve and use your gift in our local church because this is one of the means that God has given us as a body to be built up. So plan on being there. That's January 22nd. I hope you can all be there for that. And last, the body grows by means of love. Andrew Lincoln, I believe it is, says, love is the lifeblood of the church. If we want to be a body, a group of believers, a, a church, who's growing, uh, being built up towards unity, maturity, and Christ-likeness, the lifeblood of that is love. We, we want to constantly be growing in love for one another and for all. That's what we're about as a church. So here's quiz time. 
This isn't a pop quiz because I did warn you. You can say it out loud, not right this second, but think the three E's when it comes time, shout it out or say it. You don't have to yell it. You can shout it either. Who are we as a local church? What are we called to do? One, two, three. Exalt. You got it. I, I can't, it's, it's a quiz where I gave you the answer on the screen. I don't know if that's fair. But I think you did good. May God help us as we seek to do what he's called us to do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this local church that you've called us together as a body and these precious souls, these precious saints that make up this local church. Father, we thank you that you have... Uh, given us instruction in your word what we are to do as a church, what, what we are, what we're about. We ask that you'd help us to first remember these things and keep it in the forefront of our minds as we seek to uh, 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 live our lives as a church. But not just to remember it, help us to be focused on doing these things and growing in these things. None of it can we do apart from your work in our hearts, in our lives. Uh, We seek your Spirit's enablement to do these things. Help us, Father, for we want to glorify you in this increasingly dark world. Help us to be bright lights by your work in our lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.